Hello, everyone. I'd like to uh, thank you for coming. I'd like to read a brief statement. Um, I've had the privilege to serve for the past 20 years as a public representative, 13 as a member of Cabinet, 7 as leader of my party, and most of those as Taoiseach of this great country. It has been the most fulfilling time of my life. Working with colleagues, I've had the honour of helping to lead Ireland from unemployment to full employment, from a budget deficit to budget surplus, from austerity to prosperity, through a pandemic in which we saved lives and livelihoods, through Brexit when we prevented a hard border between North and South and protected our place in Europe. I'm proud that we've made the country a more equal and more modern place when it comes to the rights of children, the LGBT community, equality for women and their bodily autonomy. More recently, we've read, led the country through an inflation and cost of living crisis, the worst of which is now thankfully behind us. We've made significant steps towards affordable childcare and universal healthcare, making access to both more affordable for more people. We've made work pay better with the implementation of a national living wage, statutory sick pay, lower personal taxes, improved family leave, allowing parents to spend more time with their children in those crucial early years. I'm happy that during my time as Taoiseach, we were able to honour my commitment to double spending on the arts, culture and sport. And this is making a real difference now and will continue to do so into the future, fostering and assisting the artists and the sportsmen and women of the future. We provided leadership by increasing our spending on international development, and we've expanded our diplomatic footprint around the world, building on Ireland's already considerable soft power. The National Broadband Plan is underway, bringing fibre-based internet connections to every home, school, business and farm, and community in Ireland, which the critics said shouldn't be done. We've established the Technology Universities and the Rural Development Fund, and since 2011, we've quadrupled overall annual investment in public infrastructure. That's meant considerably more investment in priorities like housing, healthcare facilities, school buildings and climate action. And I am deeply proud that we, as Irish people, welcomed over 100,000 Ukrainian refugees to our shores when they needed our protection, notwithstanding the challenges this brings. In my time as Taoiseach, we reduced consistent poverty and income inequality. Housing construction has more than doubled, with 500 people becoming homeowners each week for the first time, the highest number in almost two decades. Of course, there are areas in which we have been much less successful, and some in which we have sadly gone backwards. But I hope you'll forgive me if I leave it to others to point them out on a day like this. They will receive plenty of airtime and column space. When I became party leader and Taoiseach back in June 2017, I knew that one part of leadership is knowing when the time has come to pass on the baton to somebody else and then having the courage to do it. That time is now. So I am resigning as president and leader of Fine Gael effective today and will resign as Taoiseach as soon as my successor is able to take up that office. I've asked our party general secretary and executive council to provide for the new leader to be elected in advance of the Ardesh on Saturday, April 16th, thus allowing a new Taoiseach to be elected when the doll resumes after the Easter break. I know this will come as a surprise to many people and a disappointment to some, and I hope at least you will understand my decision. I know that others will, how shall I put it, cope with the news just fine. That is the great thing about living in a democracy. There's never a right time to resign high office. However, this is as good a time as any. Budget 2024 is done. Negotiations have not yet commenced on the next one. The institutions of the Good Friday Agreement are working again, and our trading relationship with the UK in the post-Brexit era is settled and stable. The new Taoiseach will have a full two months to prepare for the local and European elections, and up to a year before the next general election. My reasons for stepping down are both personal and political. I believe this government can be re-elected, and I believe my party, Fine Gael, can gain seats in the next stall. Most of all, I believe the re-election of this three-party government would be the right thing for the future of our country, continuing to take us forward, protecting all that's been achieved and building on it. But after careful consideration and some soul-searching, I believe that a new Taoiseach and a new leader 
will be better placed than me to achieve that. To renew and strengthen the team, to focus our message and policies, to drive implementation. And after seven years in office, I don't feel I'm the best person for that job anymore. There are loyal colleagues and good friends contesting local and European elections, and I want to give them the best chance possible. And I think they have a better chance under a new leader. I am standing aside in the absolute confidence that the country and the economy are in a good place, and that my colleagues in government from all three parties, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and the Greens, and the Oireachtas, will continue to work hard for the nation's best interests. On a personal level, I've enjoyed being Taoiseach, leader and a cabinet member since March 2011. I've learned so much about so many things, met so many people who I'd never got to meet, been to places I would never have seen both home and abroad, and I am deeply grateful for it. And despite the challenges, would wholeheartedly recommend a career in politics to anyone who's considering it. However, politicians are human beings and we have our limitations. We give it everything until we can't anymore, and then we have to move on. I will, of course, continue to fulfill my duties as Taoiseach until a new one is elected and will remain as consistency TD for Dublin West. I know inevitably there will be speculation as to the quote unquote real reason for my decision. These are the real reasons. That's it. I have nothing else lined up. I have nothing in mind. I have no definite personal or political plans. But I'm really looking forward to having the time to think about them. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my party, my college and partners, particularly Michal and Eamon, my constituents, colleagues and staff for their loyalty and their phenomenal work. And I'm going to thank them all in person in the near future. Most of all, I want to finish by thanking the people of Ireland for giving me the opportunity to serve them. And I promise I'll keep working for Ireland and my community in any way I can in the future. Thank you very much. Taoiseach, with the referendum to the last straw, Taoiseach. role as Taoiseach until a replacement can be found. Hopefully that, he says, can be done uh, before uh, it resumes after Easter on April the 16th is the day. He said that there will be speculation about why he has chosen it, but he said, essentially, uh, politicians are human beings. We have our limitations. We give it as much as we can until we can't give it any more. One part of leadership is knowing when the time has come to pass on the baton and having the courage to do it at that time. Uh, this is that time, he said. The budget uh, for 2024 is done. The Institute of the Good Friday Agreement are working again and trading arrangements with the UK are stable. So he says that is the best time for him to stamp down. Uh, our political editor, Beth Rigby, is sitting alongside me in the studio. Um, Beth, what do you make of his decision to stand down and stand down now? Well, look, this is a bit of a bombshell in that, you know, here, when we think about leaders standing down, there's rumours and discussion and reporting. This has come under the radar. So I think uh, in Ireland, it's a little bit of a shock. But the writing has been on the wall. He has been uh, struggling in the polls. Uh, Fingal struggling in the polls, uh, lagging behind uh, Sinn Féin. Uh, he's had a number of his uh, MPs uh, saying that they will stand down. There were two big referendum defeats for Leo Varadkar in Ireland earlier this month. One was to remove sexist language from the constitution. And then there was another one about trying to expand the constitution definition of marriage, both heavy defeats. And that has left him, of course, weakened. Uh, so pool polling, referendum defeats, uh, many of his party uh, quitting. But as you said, that was a very emotional speech by him. He was the youngest uh, Taoiseach. He's only 45. He's served in that role twice. Um, he said, didn't he, Jane, politicians are humans. We give it everything until we can't anymore. And then we move on. He said that it had been the most meaningful period of his life. 
He said reasons for stepping down were both personal and political. He said, I am no longer the best person to lead. He also said there will be speculation about the real reasons, and he said to the audience, these are the real reasons. But a very big moment uh, in Irish politics. You can see him there. He was uh, in Washington with, with President Biden earlier this week. But it's, it's the end of Leo Varadkar, the youngest Taoiseach, uh, now announcing he's standing down. And in, in terms of his legacy, I mean, he has been at the head of Fine Gael and, and as Taoiseach, uh, an extraordinary period in, in Ireland's time. He, he listed it there, you know, mm. through the pandemic, through Brexit. Mm. Uh, there's been a, a lot of changes in Ireland during that time. What do you think mm. his legacy will be? Well, I think he would... I think he sort of set out what he wanted his legacy to be there, which was he felt he was leaving the post uh, with the Good Friday Agreement intact, with Brexit arrangements working, uh, well again after the Windsor Accord, the, the Assembly uh, in Northern Ireland up and running again. And, and, and I guess he feels like he has now uh, completed that circle. You remember, Jay, I mean, he was on our screens, wasn't he, nearly permanently uh, during the Brexit wars, advocating uh, for Ireland, uh, working with European partners, negotiating with our prime ministers, uh, negotiating with Northern Ireland politicians. And I, I think he would hope that that would be his legacy. The sadness for him, I think, is the first openly uh, gay uh, leader of Ireland was that some of those more socially progressive uh, things he put to the uh, Irish people in those referendums that he probably would have wanted to be a legacy moment that were rejected by the public. And I do think that that must have, those two heavy defeats in referendums that he championed about taking sexist language out of the constitution, about broadening the definition of marriage, uh, he would have wanted that to be a legacy he was defeated and heavily. And at that point, as a leader, you have to question what legitimacy you have. Mm. Uh, let's just bring in uh, the rest of our panel here in the studio. We're joined by Labour's Shadow Attorney General, Emily Thornbury, uh, the Conservative MP, Anthony Magnell, and Liberal Democrats, Christine Jardine. And here to talk about PMQs, mm -hmm. uh, but we've had to cut away from PMQs because of this breaking news. So, let, so let's get your thoughts on that. Uh, Emily, to you, first of all, what, what are your reflections on Neo Varadkar stepping down? I do think it's sad. I, he was a man who I thought a great deal of, actually. I think that he'd achieved a lot. I liked his humanity and, I don't know, I thought that he was a good representative of modern Ireland. Um, so it's, it's really sad to see him go. And, and, and for you, Anthony Magnol, he's going, he says, the time is right. Um, do you think that Rishi Sunak may reflect on that today? Uh, well, after the PMQs the Prime Minister's just had, no, I think the Prime Minister's played an absolute blinder. But in relation to Leva Agka, you know, it's always sad when a dedicated public servant steps back. Um, but he clearly lost his touch with the Irish public, which is why he was so roundly defeated in his referendum. Christine, what are your thoughts on this news? Well, that, having lost touch with um, the public does sound a bit like our own Prime Minister, doesn't it? And perhaps he should um, mull over whether... Leo Varadkar's right in saying, you know, there is a time to go. And I think, like Emily, I'm sad to see him go because he did become a big figure during the whole Brexit negotiations and he became someone who the public in this country looked to as a voice of reason. And a lot of people saw him uh, much more important to British politics and much more significant than perhaps any other previous Irish leader, certainly, that I, I can remember. But um, it is, if you like, a lesson for others. And if there's a time to go, then go. Mm. Um, Emily, you know, you, you said you had you you liked him. Um, had you had much dealings with him over the years? No, not directly. Um, I mean, I'd been involved, you know, behind the scenes. We'd had discussions, but not not directly with him. I'd spoken to my 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 connections were very much more with the ambassador. Mm. Um, and but you know, there was always a. I think people were always proud to have him as the Prime Minister. That was the thing, you know, it was kind of part of the sort of the walk, you know, the confident walk that uh, Ireland had was having a leader like that. So I am genuinely sorry to see him go. I guess also what's, what's interesting about this is it has come as a surprise because Leo Varadkar is perhaps seeing the writing on the wall in terms of polling of his party, MPs deciding to step down, 
two hefty defeats in referendums. Mm -hmm. And just to put it into context, the, the first one about changing language, about removing reference to women's care duties in the home, 74% of voters rejected that amendment. And on the second mm. one about expanding definition of family, just over 67.7 uh, people rejected that. So they are hefty defeats. And I guess this is a lesson in a politician perhaps seeing the writing on the wall and going before they are forced to go. So he's doing it on his terms, a bit like the way in which uh, Nicola Sturgeon at that moment, she went before things emerged. But in that moment, I know you're looking at me like that, Christine, uh, but, but the point was that she... You, you yeah. can see subsequently it you might have it, been for other, but yeah. she kind of did it on her terms. And, and obviously, um, the New Zealand uh, Jacinta, uh, she obviously went on her own terms as well. It's quite rare in politics to find someone going before they're pushed. But I think it wasn't just losing the referendum. I think it was a heck of a mess. I think that was the, mm. that was the problem. You hear stories of people campaigning one way and voting another, people not really understanding what it was that they were voting on. It was just a mess. It was just done badly. And probably you can perhaps read more into the results of that referendum in terms of what Ireland currently thinks about issues, because the whole thing was was just was just put before the public in such a messy way they weren't really sure what it was at the end of the day they were voting on and what the implications of it was. So not just losing, but doing it badly, I'm afraid. If you're just tuning our way, you're watching Sky News. Uh, Leo Varadkar, the Irish uh, Prime Minister, has announced that he is standing down. Uh, let's just take a little look back at his political career. Well, on the 14th of June 2017, Leo Varadkar was appointed Prime Minister of Ireland following the resignation of Enda Kenny. Then, in June 2020, Mr Varadkar stepped down after coming third in the Irish general election. Nearly two and a half years later, in December 2022, he returned as Prime Minister after Michael Martin's resignation. Then a little over a month ago, two referendums were held on proposed amendments to the Irish constitution. The government was defeated in both of those referendums. Then on Friday last week, Mr Varadkar was in the US where he urged President Biden to work towards an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. And today he announced he was stepping down again as Prime Minister. Well, let's return to our panel in the studio. A, a Christine, Christine Jardine, Lib Dem MP mm -hmm. uh, for Edinburgh. Back to those referendums, that there were, there were others who said that perhaps he misjudged the mood of the Irish people. There, there are those who mm -hmm. say that the referendums weren't well framed and, and weren't, weren't well publicised. But is it also a warning to politicians, perhaps, a, on this side of the, of the pond uh, about listening to the electorate and, and actually understanding who the electorate are? I think so. Uh, the thing that struck me about them was the size of the defeat. We've become mm. used in this country to the Scottish referendum was 55-45, the European referendum that was, what, 2% in it. We've become used to very close referenda. So to see something that big, it's obviously been misjudged. That wasn't the time to have that referendum. It should have been clear to the politicians that the Irish public wasn't ready to consider it. So yes, we do need to listen much more and we do need to be aware, it's what I said when I meant, there's a time to go. If you have lost the public and the public mood is against you, as it obviously was, Leo Varadkar recognised that. And I think there's a lesson for us all in that. And if you look back at our referendum, this com uh, country, David Cameron went right away, Alex Salmond went right away, and I think it's the right thing to do. We're just gonna cross back to Dublin uh, because Michal Martin, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, is speaking. Thank Antisha Leo Vradkar for his service to the country, uh, both in his capacity as a uh, member of Dáilíre and as a minister, and of course uh, as Taoiseach uh, and, and latterly Tánaiste, and then Taoiseach um, again. Uh, last evening, uh, the Taoiseach uh, briefed uh, myself and Eamon Ryan in relation to his plans. Um, to be honest, I was surprised, obviously, when I, when I heard what he was uh, going to do. Uh, but I want to take the opportunity uh, to thank him sincerely. We, we got on very well. We had a strong personal relationship. Uh, the three leaders had, which I think was important in terms of the continuity and stability uh, of, of, of the government. Uh, and I want to take this opportunity again to wish Lior uh, the very best uh, in his personal life and in his um, career uh, in, into the future. Uh, could I afford to say that um, from, from my perspective, uh, this is a coalition of three parties, uh, not personalities. 
uh, and I remain committed uh, to the continuation of government, uh, to the fulfilment of our man mandate and to the implementation of the programme for government. Uh, there are still very serious issues uh, to be dealt with, housing, um, education, uh, health, climate, uh, energy. Uh, and today, for example, the uh, future fund uh, legislation went through Cabinet um, along with the infrastructure and climate legislation. Uh, so from my perspective, from my party's perspective, uh, we are going to fulfil our mandate where we will work with the newly elected uh, leader of the Fine Gael party uh, in terms of continuing the coalition. Uh, and I've been very consistent from the very beginning uh, that my view is the government should go uh, full term uh, and um, that, that remains uh, my, my, my position as of uh, today. A lot of work to be done uh, and we're going to continue to focus on getting that work done. Paul Cunningham from RT News. Does your um, coalition have credibility? Does it have legitimacy now that Leo Varadkar has uh, stood down? Would it not be better to call a general election? The constitution is very clear in this, Paul. Of course the government has, has, has credibility. Um, individuals, and in fairness to the Taoiseach, uh, you know, he's entitled to take uh, a decision of this kind uh, for personal reasons, as he said himself, and, 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 and political reasons. He has taken that decision. Uh, our, our system of government, uh, as laid out in the Constitution, uh, is in terms of a Doyle majority electing a government of the day and ministers of the day, and that is no different uh, as, as a result of this decision. Um, and so it is new. It's, uh, we, we live, you know, it's unprecedented in many ways, but it has happened before where uh, Taoiseach have been elected midstream in different Dáilne. Uh, so, um, in my view, we have a clear mandate, we have a clear programme for government. The government has done well in terms of the objectives of the programme for government, in terms of the management of the economy, in terms of uh, very significant progress in education uh, and in health, um, and in terms of navigating uh, COVID-19, the war on Ukraine, um, and, and um, many, many challenges have, that have come our way. Tony, can you tell, tell us a little bit about how you found out this morning and where you, or did you find out yesterday, for example, uh, or when did you find out, how did you find out, were you shocked, uh, and do you have any preference as to who succeeds the other actor as Fine Gael leader in Tuesday? When you may not have picked up earlier, um, last evening after the normal leaders' meeting, uh, the Taoiseach asked uh, myself and Eamon Ryan to stay behind, uh, and so he um, briefed us in, in terms of his plans and he told us what he was intending to do um, today, I was sh surprised, very surprised, didn't expect it uh, at all. Um, and um, uh, on a personal level, um, you know, I, 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 as I said, a very good relationship uh, with Leo Radker. I think the three party leaders uh, have always been in a position to resolve any policy differences. We had a good process in terms of flagging issues, updating each other on, on particular issues. And on a personal level, we got on well. Um, and. Um, I think that was important in terms of the smooth running um, of the government, in terms of the organisation of government uh, through the various cabinet subcommittees, uh, the government itself and the, and, and the whole process of getting policy positions ironed out and, 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 and resolved. So from that perspective, you know, it, 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 uh, um, it's not something I had anticipated. Um, and, um, but I do wish uh, Leo the very best and not an easy decision for him to take. Uh, a lot of courage in that decision um, as well. Um, and um, so uh, in terms of, uh, I think you, you know the answer to the latter part of your question. Um, it's not for any Fianna Fáil leader to uh, comment on who the next leader of Fine Gael should be. But I don't, it's, look, it's a matter for the Fine Gael party. They will have their election to democratic process. Just as a follow-up to that, would you accept that there is, the coalition becomes inherently more in, unstable after the election of a new T-shirt because they might have a mind to seek a mandate from the public, which they wouldn't have in the same way that Leo Varadkar has. My sense is the public want politicians to focus on the day-to-day -day issues that, that, that concern them. Um, a solid economic management, um, proper uh, distribution of resources uh, in terms of services around education, around health, uh, childcare and so forth. Uh, the public wants us to focus on the issues, and I think the public, my sense, uh, having been around, 
uh, is, uh, people feel this government uh, uh, has done a good job since the inception. Obviously, we had very major issues from COVID onwards at the start of the government. Uh, and you know my view, you for a long, long time, has been governments should go full term. That's my view, because um, that creates stability. It avoids short-term decision-making. Um, and it, it gives a better, um, I think, uh, policy focus uh, than a short-term electoral one. Uh, and that is why uh, I've been absolutely steadfast and consistent on this from the very beginning of this government, that it should go its full term. That remains my position. Uh, and the newly elected leader, Fine Gael, I will articulate that as well as, my, uh, as being my position. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, well, Bola mar dúis báire uh, a rága mo bhféachas a gcoil de liar vádcar, as ocht an méid sheriffis a tatuga chéige uh, do vinte na tíre mar hacht a dála mar aire agus mar hiseach agus mar hánaiste agus tíseach ar ísht agus uh, uh, sail an an a iacair a fad é sail an falatóir. Uh, well, as he's speaking Gaelic, we'll step away from Michal Martin, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, of Ireland, uh, also the Defence Minister, uh, he was formerly the uh, Foreign Minister, um, explaining that he was told last night that um, Leo Varadkar was going to st step down. He was surprised, um, but doesn't feel that it should lead to enormous constitutional change. Um, we've got... Um, Bestel here, as well as our panel. Beth, just a quick thought. Um, he was asked, does the coalition have legitimacy? Mm. Should a general election be called. Will there be pressure for this, do you think? Well, I mean, look, it was the first question. I mean, he stood up, said it was a surprise. Uh, we're going to continue on. Uh, they actually have a mandate. They, they work on a five-year basis as well. So the latest that you can hold a, an election in Ireland is March 2025. Uh, clearly there, the deputy saying we want, we, we, we want to have uh, an election uh, later and we're going to carry on as we were. Of course, it's a question. I mean, the leader has just stood down and, and, you know, both parties are lagging Sinn Féin in the polls. So you can imagine what Sinn Féin have got to say about it. Interestingly, uh, a British politician that has done a lot of dealings uh, in Ireland has flagged the idea of, will Simon Coveney go for it? We might know Simon mm. Coveney from um, Brexit days. I definitely mm. dealt I with do. him. Yeah. Uh, but already, uh, certainly over here, uh, he's been talked about mm. as a potential successor to Leo uh, Varadkar. But of course, there'll be questions about, um, about whether to call an election when the two leading parties are lagging Sinn Féin in the polls. And yet, you know, they're the, the, the top two dogs. Before we let our panel go, just, just a, a final quick thought from all of you on, on your reflections on him and, and, and what do you think his legacy has been? Emily? So, um, can I just also say, it's a, it's a complicating factor when you have a coalition mm. and the leader of one of the three parties mm. then stands down. I think it makes it even more unstable. And I think for the many people in the UK with Irish heritage, such as myself, you know, we have close ties with Ireland. I'm very pleased that Sky is covering this because I think this is a really important issue. Relations between Britain and Ireland have always been really close. I think the thing that people will remember, Leo, about probably for, for, for more than anything else, is perhaps the way in which you stood up against the idea of there being a border across, a land border across Ireland. And he fought that and he was right to do so. And for the sake of peace and the future of the people in North and South, he did a really good thing and he will be, he will be remembered for that. Anthony Magnus? Well, I mean, listen, I'm not sure what else I can add to that. I mean, I agree entirely on, on that point. I mean, I think it's absolutely essential that we have a strong leader in the Republic of Ireland that works closely with the United Kingdom and that we continue to have a relationship that works for the interests of both our people. I think that's as, as simple as that. As for what he'll be remembered for, I don't know. I mean, you know, they say all politics ends in failure. I'm not sure that's the case. I hope it's not the case, certainly for all of us on this panel. But... Um, you know, he's, he's, he's a dedicated public servant and at a point where everyone is very dismissive about politics, it's nice to see someone who's so keen about politics and certainly I take the same view, which is that you've got to get out there and do it and it's a wonderful job. Christine, your reflections on I think I, I agree with Emily, but I think he was the man for the hour and very much what we needed in the United Kingdom in, some, in the Irish Prime Minister to deal with and I think he dealt with it well. I think he's also... He has set an example. He has recognised that he's lost the public. He's probably lost the support of his own politicians and chose the right time to go. And I think that is significant in itself. It shows judgement. It shows respect for the public. And it says a great deal about the man himself. Thanks very much, Christine, Jardine, Anthony Magnell and Emily Thornbury. Thank you all so much for coming in.
Well, uh, let's talk now to Senator John McGahn, who's a Fine Gael politician and Irish senior sen senator for the Cultural and Educational Panel. Uh, so on the same party uh, as Leo Varadka. Very good to talk to you today. Why do you think he's going? It's, it's very hard to say because it's come as a real shock to all of us. So, for example, I was in a meeting there for an hour. I had my phone turned off. I came out of the meeting and my phone has exploded that uh, Leo was resigning. I don't think any of us were expecting this. I was very much under the impression and very much looking forward to Leo Varadkar leading us into the next general election, which is only a, maybe a year away at most or six months away. But what I would say is, and to be very clear about this, especially in the last seven years, when things were at their worst within Ireland, Leo Varadkar was at his absolute best. He absolutely was an incredible leader. And when I say he was at his best throughout the Brexit negotiations, throughout the COVID crisis, throughout the cost of living and inflation crisis that we've experienced, and uh, in particular, the social change that we have seen in the last five or six years within Ireland, particularly the repeal, the eighth referendum, where for your watchers, we liberalised our abortion laws. So as I've said, it's very, very clear to me in the last couple of years, when things were at their worst, our Taoiseach, our party leader, leader Leo Varadkar, was at his very best. And to be quite honest, I'm very sorry today to see the news. I'm I'm quite upset about it. You could hear the emotion in Leo's voice. I've spoken to a few of my colleagues now. I'm on the way from Dundalk, where I live, to Leinster House, where we have in a meeting of the parliamentary party this evening with the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar. And I think this is a sad day for the Fine Gael family and the Fine Gael party. Uh, I still felt Leo had a very good message to sell to the Irish people ahead of the next general election. I was really looking forward to following Le uh, Leo uh, into that election as, as our leader. And I think now is a good point to reflect on all the good that Leo Varadkar has done as Taoiseach for this country since 2017. Uh, he, he said, of course, there will be his critics and that, that he would leave it for others to, to say what those criticisms are. Um, but the fact that he lost those two referendums, did he did he jump before he was pushed? Had, had he lost the support of the Irish people, do you think? Oh, absolutely not. And just to take the point up from uh, Christine Jordan, MP, beforehand, she said she he'd maybe lost the support of politicians. The support of Leo Varadkar within the parliamentary party was huge. We all were firmly behind Leo. We firmly believed in his vision. We firmly believed in his leadership. Uh, so there was no issue whatsoever. There was no rumblings of any leadership heaves, nothing like that. Um, certainly not compared to the Conservative Party in the UK at the minute. So Leo enjoyed the full support of his parliamentary party, uh, of his ministers, of councillors around the country. So it wasn't an issue like that. I think it was really just a case of Leo Varadkar recognising himself that now is a good time to leave, that he had left the country in a very stable economic position. We have full employment. We have a rip-roaring economy, the fastest growing in the European Union. And I think now that Leo felt it, it was a time to go for himself, to give a new leader and a new Taoiseach time before our local elections, which are in June, uh, to give a new leader and Taoiseach time before a general election, whenever that will happen, whether it's later this autumn or this time next year. So I think what's a mark of Leo Radker is he's leaving at a time of his own choosing. And that's something that I really hugely respect. And mm. um, what impact do you think it'll have on the Fine Gael party? We, we saw behind him, you were talking about him being emotional and hearing it in his voice. Uh, we saw one of his colleagues behind appearing to wipe a tear away as, as he was speaking. Is the party diminished by him going? No, I don't think the party would be diminished. Uh, well, no, first of all, it would be my simple answer to that. But what I think the party will experience is, you know, a deep sense of sadness because Leo was an inc is an incredibly kind, caring and compassionate individual. He's been personally very good to me in the last five or six years throughout my time in national politics. And he is someone that, you know, was a really good leader and looked after his parliamentary party, really cared and concerned about people. But, you know, we're now going to have a leadership election. I have absolutely no idea who's going to run in that or who would be fit to succeed him. But we will uh, have that leadership election ourselves. We hope to have it in place for our party conference or Ardesh at the start of April and a new Taoiseach elected thereafter. And whoever becomes my leader uh, after this will have our full and utter support, not only of myself, but of the entire Fine Gael Parliamentary Party. Um, a lot of people already on Twitter and across here in the UK are talking about Simon Coveney, currently the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment, but of course uh, became well known uh, during the Brexit negotiations. Uh, would he be a shoo in for the job, do you think? I don't think it's really even kind of considering who would be a shoe in or who wouldn't, because really what we're trying to do today is to acknowledge the huge amount of work that Leo Varadkar has done as Taoiseach, 
uh, as our party leader. And before we start talking about who may succeed or who may not succeed, I think it's important to acknowledge the work that Leo has done, uh, particularly in the next couple of days. But we have, and this is one of the strengths actually of the Fine Gael party, we have a number of very serious performers at a cabinet level. We have a number of very serious performers at a junior ministerial level. And we have a lot of very strong and capable, capable backbench uh, TDs, which are members of parliament. So I think we have a number of options uh, as who may uh, succeed Leo. But today is not the time for that conversation. The next few days is not the time for that conversation. And the Fine Gael Parliamentary Party will, will make that decision along with the elected party councillors and along with the membership of our party uh, in the coming weeks. You heard, a, you heard a question there to Michael Martin about whether or not a general election should be called. I mean, do you think that that is something that should be considered? Is the coalition fractured? Not at all. The coalition is very stable. And I listened to Beth Rigby there to say that, you know, that the, the government are lagging Sinn Féin in the polls. Like, that's just not correct. Sinn Féin have gone from a high of 35% a number of months ago to a low of 27%. Now, the government combined parties are on 40 41%. So that's really not a case uh, when it comes to that. The coalition is very strong. There's a very good working relationship between Eamon Ryan, the Green Party, uh, between Michal Martin and Fianna Fáil, and indeed my own party at Fine Gael. I, I don't see a general election happening as a result of this. I don't see one being triggered as a result of this. If anything, I think it increases the likelihood that the uh, full term until March 2025 will actually be served out then. OK, Senator John McGahn, Fine Gael politician and Centre for Cultural and Educational Panel. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Right, let's cross to Skies Island. Correspondent Stephen Murphy. Uh, busy day for you, Stephen. This came out the blue, didn't it? Oh, listen, I've never seen such a political bombshell kept under wraps to the extent that this news has been kept under wraps for the day. I mean, it is simply, there is a sense of disbelief around this place. This is government buildings here uh, behind us where we just saw Leo Varadkar announce uh, his resignation as leader of Fine Gael and ultimately leading to his resignation as Taoiseach as well. But uh, new proposals on assisted dying were top of the political agenda here in Ireland for the day. And we were hanging around the other side of this building is the parliamentary building, Leinster House, and all the talk, all the gossip uh, this morning was about that. No one had any inkling of this announcement coming down the tracks. And when you look back at uh, recent events, certainly some signs were on the wall. Leo Varadkar has been under pressure, and especially with the exodus of his sitting TDs, TDs, the Irish members of Parliament. So 10 have now. Kieran Cannon uh, from Galway announced that he would not stand at the next election just last week, and that brought to 10 the number of his party's TDs in the door, the Irish Parliament, who announced that they would not put them themselves up for re-election. And if that doesn't sound like a huge number, maybe by UK standards or international standards, you've got to bear in mind that he was able to form a government the last time, a coalition government, uh, after getting 33 TDs elected in total from his party. So 30% of Fine Gael's TDs that were elected back in the last election in 2020 have already announced that they simply are not putting their name forward for consideration. That sort of exodus will always raise questions about the party leadership and the grumblings had been there and then wham, along came those twin referendum defeats. They were not just defeats. Uh, these are the twin referendums earlier this month uh, to remove what was called sexist and outdated language from the Irish Constitution, also to redefine uh, marriage in the Irish Constitution as well. These weren't just defeats by the Irish electorate, they were trounced by the Irish electorate. The latter referendum was defeated by 74%, a 74% no vote. That is the highest no vote ever in the history of Irish referendums. And this is a country that has a lot of referendums. And that really amplified the feelings of discontent within Fianna Gael, within the party. And certainly there were whispers and there were certainly murmurings of discontent there. But I don't think anyone had really seen something like this coming down the tracks so soon. And it's an interesting time. We're just seven weeks out uh, from the local and European elections. And really, to read between the lines, there could be a sense here that Leo Varadkar simply came to the understanding and came to the realisation that the party would do better at the ballot box without his leadership, under a fresh leader. And then as well, the general election, I mean, the government has a maximum of another year up until March next year, but everybody was expecting a general election, much like in the UK, maybe in October or November this year. 
and certainly you know, Leo Varadkar is now clearly of the opinion that he needs to give any new Fine Gael leader, which we should know after the Easter break, who will then become Taoiseach, he wants to give that new leader a bit of time to try and produce a bounce, to try and produce that new leader bounce that political parties crave. And he wants to see, therefore, that new leader get a bit of time to get their feet under the desk here at government buildings ahead of the local and European elections in June and then, of course, the announcement of the general election, which we do still expect, despite what Micheál Martin, his coalition partner, the leader of Fianna Fáil, he wants to go full term. That remains to be seen. OK, uh, Stephen, we'll talk to you again uh, at the top of the hour. So thanks very much for just bringing us up to date. Uh, let's talk to Bobby McDonough now, the former Irish ambassador to the UK. Uh, Bobby McDonough, what's, what's your reaction to this breaking news today? I think it took everybody by surprise, including Leo Varadkar's closest political associates. Uh, but I think it's more of a political drama than a political earthquake. We have a very stable democracy and we have a very effective coalition uh, system of government. And there has already been one change of prime minister in the course of this government because it was agreed that Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael would share the job for two and a half years each. And that transition took place very smoothly. So Leo Varadkar has said he will stay on until his successor is chosen. And I think the government will continue for whatever portion of the remaining year in office that the new uh, leader decides to, to, to continue before calling an election. So I think I should say to, to your UK viewers that uh, these changes of prime ministership that we have had, this one and the other one a couple of years ago, are not fractious like they have been within the Conservative Party. It's They're effectively a coalition government working effectively. So therefore, when we look at the relationship between the UK and Ireland, what do you take from it? Is it steady as she goes still? Yes, I think so. I mean, the relationship has had its ups and downs. It, it reached its, its apotheosis at the time of the Queen's visit. Then it was shaken badly by Brexit and by the decision to seek a hard form of Brexit and by some of the, the Boris Johnson carry on. But it's now, it's now back on an even keel um, and we have to work at it. Uh, and I think that this change of Prime Minister, even though Leo Radko was very um, constructive in his relationship with Britain, I don't think there will be any, any change of policy in that regard. And I think we... You know, there are still difficulties related to Brexit and we still have a lot of work to do to get back to exactly where we were. But I think the new Taoiseach will do that in the same way that Leo Varadkar was trying to do. Who would be on your list of, of possible names? Would Simon Coveney be up there? Well, he obviously is a candidate, but I think there are, I mean, I, I, as a number of your, um, uh, your interviewees mentioned, a number of members of the Fine Gael Parliamentary Party have decided to stand down and not to run in the next election. But there are a number of, uh, senior ministers who have a very strong reputation. And I mean, it's not like uh, at Cheltenham last week where you can pick an Irish winner, um, but there are some very strong candidates, including, for example, um, Pascal Donoghue, who is the chair of the Eurogroup in Brussels, uh, and Simon Harris and Helen McEntee and so on. So there's, there's, there's really, even though some of the ordinary TTs MPs are leaving, at the top of the party, there seems to be a pretty good choice available. Uh, you're, a, you're a man who, who's, who's, who's been involved in politics for a considerable number of years. I'm just reflecting on the fact that, that he's today spoken about politics, politicians being human beings, we have our limitations, um, we give it everything we, we can, uh, uh, but then we have to stop. And also, we, we've also seen, you know, the Welsh leader stepping down, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand mm. also says, stepping down, talking about how they've, they've just lost the energy. Do you think we're seeing greater honesty from some politicians now? Well, I think it's, it's, it's good that people don't hang on in office beyond their sell-by sell date. Uh, I don't think there was great pressure on Leo Varadkar to go, but I think it shows great maturity to do what the people you've mentioned did, the Pope has done, and recently the Chancellor of Oxford, I think, became the first Chancellor since before the Duke of Wellington to, to stand down, um, to announce his standing down while in office. So, yes, I, 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 but I think that the point that Leo Varadkar emphasised most was that he believed that a different leader would be better placed to okay. lead his party into the next general election. And I think, Bobby? I think there's an element of political judgment involved as well. Okay, Bobby McDonough, we're going to leave it there. Thanks a lot.